right. So uh, welcome to the AOC PMNR podcast. We're here today with Dr. Monica Verduzco Gutierrez. Uh, thanks a lot for being here chatting with us. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Um, so you are the current chair for the Department of Physical Medicine, Medicine and Rehabilitation at the UT Health San Antonio uh, Department. And you are also a competitive distance runner, a mother, and a uh, avid Twitter user. Is that a pretty yeah. fair uh, assessment of your, of your history? Yes, all of the above. <laughs> awesome. Um, so we just want to talk to you today about, uh, first of all, what was your journey into medicine and PM&R like? Um, what led you into medicine and ultimately... How did you end up as a physiatrist? Were you considering other specialties or was this what you wanted all along? What, what was your journey like? All right. So I guess to start from the beginning, when I, I'm the first physician in my family. And so before that, you know, a lot of my family's in education and my parents, when we were growing up, had, you know, wanted to really push education, the importance of education and doing well in school when growing up, I really looked up to my own physician. So looked up to my pediatrician and our family doctor and all the care that they gave to our family who were happened to be Hispanic men. And then that kind of interests me a lot into go into medicine. So years later down the road, yes, yes. You know, I was a very good student. I checked all those boxes. I was, uh, went to undergrad in a one of those programs that gets you into undergrad and medical school together. So that was very nice. Awesome. And, yeah. And then when I went into medical school, I thought I was going to be a pediatrician because I really enjoyed my pediatrician growing up and little kids are so cute. And I had thought that's what I was going to do. I'd even done some summer programs, both, pre-med and in my early years of medical school, shadowing pediatricians. Mm -hmm. And when I was in my, still in my pre-clinical years of medical school, I, I went to Baylor College of Medicine and they had an elective, a pre-clinical elective that was sports medicine. And I was like, great, I want to do this. I'll, I like sports. I will, you know, likely take care of kids who have sports injuries or high school athletes or whatever it might be. And so I should take this elective. Well, I took the elective and it was an elective put together by PM&R. So it wasn't your typical oh, ortho, you know, sports medicine elective. It was PM&R. So it was my first introduction to PM&R. And I was like, okay, cool. There's this other specialty and they take care of sports injuries and, and patients with disabilities. This is great. I should uh, try it out. And then one of the PM&R residents at the time in our program had been someone that I'd gone to college with. Well, he was like years older than I was. So I was like, oh, he's like a normal, cool guy. He talked to me about it. All right, I should do an elective in this and did my first PM&R elective and then really fell in love with it. So the different aspects of it, still like seeing patients longitudinally, being able to care for them for a long time, seeing patients get better, mm -hmm. having still challenging cases. Um, and so it really interests me. And I liked a lot of different things along the way as well. So I really still liked neurology. Okay, well, now I'm a brain injury doctor. So that ties in the neurology, um, you know, rheumatology. I still like doing things with my hands. And I get to do now a lot of spasticity management, interventional procedures that way. Um, I like the taking care of patients for long term. So that was kind of where maybe it differed a little bit from some of the neurology who just kind of diagnose the problem so we get to see them and fix them long term. So that's probably some of why I liked PM&R and ended up in PM&R and very happy to do so, even though I'd never heard of it before I went into medical school. And yeah, that sounds pretty typical. A lot of people, it seems like it's it's kind of under the rug. It just looks like another acronym that I, I don't even have the time to look up what that is. And then people find it really late in the game and then it just clicks with them. And it, it sounds like that's kind of how it worked with you as well. Right. But it's important that students find it early. So it's important that we get in the preclinical curriculums as much as possible so that we can have the best students going into our field. Right. Um, do you feel like in general, do medical schools do a good job of exposing their students to rehabilitation medicine, or is that an area that needs improvement? I think it needs improvement. I think 
you know, it just kind of depends where you are. Some people may get that exposure. It's something we need to look into more, you know, where is it an, an elective that you have to do? And then maybe more students go into it. Who gets exposure to it? At what point do they get exposure? And, but I think it's important that people do just more and more paid patients that are getting older, patients living with disabilities, and we need to have all medical professionals be exposed to that. Right. And, and I feel like this challenge is even more pronounced for a lot of osteopathic medical students. If we are not connected to a large academic hospital, like many of our schools are, uh, we're never going to see a rehab unit until we're you know in that setting. And it's sort of ironic that uh, PM&R seems like it's always a good fit for a lot of DO students who are interested in that, that that's sort of like a thing that people say. And it just seems like if more people, especially osteopathic students, could be exposed to it earlier, they could just be a much better. I mean, I, I'm sure they still end up being good residents, but I just feel like you could you could have so much more additional preparation by the time you match into your residency. So that's a that's an interesting thought. Yeah, I don't. Know. I think DOs have been excellent residents whenever I get them, so I'm not too worried about y'all. Oh, but I love sounds good. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so nowadays, what does a typical workday look like for you? I'm sure it's different as a, as a chair than you have different duties and stuff, but what is like a normal eight to five or whatever your hours are? What can you walk us through right. a day? So it just kind of depends on the day. There's some days where I have clinical and maybe three or four half days a week or more of clinical and then the rest of the days at administrative time. So for example, you know, come in, do recently been doing a lot of telemedicine for some of my outpatient stuff. And then otherwise there's scheduled meetings, there's budget hearings, there's meetings with my faculty planning. There's other times where I just, you know, write and work on manuscript writing and then go back to another meeting. <laughs> and so it's, um, it's that and every day is a little bit different, just sure. kind of depends. And then there's some days I'm doing inpatient consults. So I love still you know, doing consults, getting to work with the residents. And so that's still, you know, getting to teach, getting to see patients. So still the the core of why I went into PM&R and I'm doing what I'm doing, but it gives you all also a really good insight into what's going on. So mm -hmm. keeps my mind fresh in not just the educational part of it, but what's happening with residents, what's happening with the training, what's happening in the hospital. You know, we're in the middle of a surge here. What um, what are the needs of the hospital at that time? Okay. And then sure. I'll go back and I do try to have lunch. It's important. <laughs> and yeah, then work till yeah. That's what they say. Yes, that's what they say, right. <laughs> And then just work till the day's done. Go back later, maybe finish signing notes and reply to a lot of emails. Okay. Um, Very and, exciting stuff. No, that, that it is. It is. It's, and it's important too. Um, yes. And at, out of all the daily activities you do for your job, what do you enjoy the most? Like what, what sparks the most joy? What do you like to do? Is it procedures? Is it teaching? I love seeing light bulbs go off. So, you know, teaching better as much as possible when people are there and it's in a setting and then you see residents or students that are learning and whether that be them learning by hands-on or them learning by something that you're verbally teaching them or just making connections or seeing their note and them putting everything together correctly and thinking through the right process then to me that you know brings a lot of joy. That, and then I also love patients with severe brain injuries and disorders of consciousness and seeing them first wake up. That's also like just, you know, both of those things are like dopamine, dopamine, dopamine mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Okay, that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, right. And then outside of your job, what do you enjoy doing the most? Um, outside of my job, I like spending time with my family and exercising, probably those things. Not that I'm exercising all the time, but I do always have to make time for exercise every day. And then uh, like most recently, as my kids are growing up, they're both in middle school, just getting to know them better, learning their little personalities and what they're into and just hearing, you know, how funny and witty they are now and how intelligent. I just kind of love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. I have a, a two-year-old myself and we're going to have another baby any day now. So that's the kind of stuff I'm trying to like 
appreciate more while a medical student and I'm sure it just keeps that level of difficulty throughout your career but you know this stuff's awesome and you know I I appreciate and relate to that I guess yeah congratulations thank you very stoked Um, and so talking about uh, the actual UT Health San Antonio PM&R program for residencies um, what would you say are the strengths of this program does it like offer any unique clinical exposure are are you guys like the the best at blank what are your guys' strengths would you say the best at everything. <laughs> everything? Okay, there yeah. you have it. Right, yeah. Don't, don't mess now. with Texas. That's what I'm learning Don't a lot. mess with Texas. Everything's yeah. bigger and better in Texas, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that it's a very strong outpatient physical medicine type program. So the residents have, you know, they definitely by far excel, get all their months that they need to get in their outpatient. The other thing is that it's a four-year program and a categorical program. So in that first year, it's very centered around learning things for rehabilitation medicine. It isn't just a whole year of surgery or a whole year of internal medicine. Yes, there's some of that, but they're doing neurology, they're doing rheumatology, they're doing orthopedic clinics already going in from first year to second year. They've done tons of injections already because they've been in you know, ortho clinic and they've had hands-on skills for that. And so that's very, well, that's one of the strengths of the program is a very well-rounded physiatric defined categorical residency program where they start at that first year getting the foundation and then it just builds on that. And so I think, of course, the program's really strong in EMG. They have, you know, one of the big names of EMG here, Dr. Dimitru. And the residents also graduate with sometimes 500 EMGs when it's only, you know, you need 200 to finish the recommendation. So, yeah, so they have that a lot of outpatient exposure. They have also exposure at different training, different places to train, including a VA. And the VA has one of the five polytrauma centers in the United States. So they get really good type of traumatic brain injury patients and rehabilitation patients there. And the faculty are amazing. The faculty love to teach. They're really enthusiastic about the program. They love the residents. They love to take care of the residents and teach the residents. And I just think it's it's a whole package deal here. That sounds awesome. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, would you say this program has like a culture? And if so, what is it? Is everyone athletic? Is everyone just friendly and laid back? Is everyone competitive? What, what is it like there? All right. So I'm relatively new here. So that's definitely one thing that I'm learning. And so I think definitely a culture of caring, very, you know, oriented towards caring for each other, family oriented. Some of them happen to have families, a lot of uh, residents that have children and kids and but not, then also they are athletic too. I was realizing, oh, a lot of the residents, they like to they like to work out, they like to do CrossFit, they do, you know, they go to someone's gym that's kind of built out as a, as a gym and a CrossFit gym. They're even doing workouts where they were like pushing cars because they couldn't go to a real gym because of COVID things are closed. So they're kind of intense in a good way. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> you know, they're, they're real well rounded. So they'll work and they'll get the work done and they're early and they, and do everything to the best of their ability. And then they you know, work hard and play hard, but play hard, like working work out. out. So <laughs> work hard, play hard, work out hard as you're playing hard, something like right, that. Right, exactly. And then like love your family and have time with your family. That sounds, that <laughs> sounds lovely, yeah. Yeah, it's great. And what is San Antonio like? I, I was there briefly for the last AAPMNR conference last mm-hmm. fall. and. You know, you're there a couple of days. I saw the Alamo, waited in line for the Alamo. We, we went down to the river walk. That was awesome. But I really, it's hard to get like a vibe of like, what is that city like? What's it like to live there? So again, I um, lived here only a short period of time, but- You're the best person to tell us then because you're seeing it and experiencing it. And that's, you know, yeah. probably at the beginning is when you notice things the most, so. Right. But actually, I grew up in South Texas, more South Texas, so on the border okay, region okay. with Mexico. So actually growing up, and we weren't well off, we used to, our vacations in the summer would be driving to San Antonio. And so to me, San Antonio is this magical city of, you know, there's things to do and people are friendly and the food's really good and you can go to you know, Six Flags and um, there's always 
good, you know, family things to do since that's what we did growing up. And then I, my sister lives here in town as well. So um, I've had family here. So we come to San Antonio a lot. And I just think it's a, it's a big city. It's not one of the biggest cities in Texas at all, but it is a big city, but it doesn't, it, with a small city feel still, just because people are, are nice and kind and, you know, so it's a good place to be there's the it's affordable so for people that don't that maybe have a family or want to save money in residency then you, they can get a lot of bang for their buck in housing and and it, everyone drives for the most part so you come here with a car <laughs> okay good to know. and then so even if you might have to live you know a little bit further out to get the place that you want to live you can at least drive into work and it shouldn't be a problem okay great yeah. And I, w I wanted to ask you also about this current COVID pandemic. And I mean, a bunch of questions. It, it's really just like a crazy time for medical students applying places. And no one really knows in the future. Everything's up in the air, especially with a second wave coming. And I, I believe Texas is considered a hot spot now. So as far as audition rotations or interviewing, and are they going to be virtual? Are they going to be in person? There's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of fear that people aren't going to be able to stand out the, the way that they want to. And I was just wondering, do you have any advice about how a student can stand out in this very unique application season and anything related to COVID that, that is going on at your program that you could tell us about? Okay, so first part around COVID. So this is the height of COVID right now for San Antonio and for Texas. As just the cases, even in the hospital, have more than doubled in the last week here. In, in San Antonio. And so it's to the point where we're going towards our redeployment plan, and that's for our physicians and for residents. Our inpatient rehab unit, that's a hospital based unit, has closed or is, you know, not accepting any more patients because those have to become medicine, medicine beds. And so that's how serious it is where they needed this extra space in the hospital to serve all sorts of patients that are coming into the hospital. And then we're best figuring out where to, we have a redeployment plan for trainees and for physicians. And it just kind of depends on the tiered se severity at the time. So you know, everyone's here and everyone's gonna have support even if they have to go to more of the front lines. So that's what's going on with COVID. Also, you know, the VA is prepared as well. They're not doing kind of their in-person outpatient right now they're just working on freeing beds to be able to take care of covid patients right now okay. and um, so it's serious everyone wear your masks wash your hands and of course that's changed like you said what's going to happen to the residents who are MS start, I mean, not the residents, the med students who are in their starting their fourth year right now and going through the process and it's going to be virtual. And it's basically come out and said, this is going to be virtual. All the interviews are going to be virtual and also very limited on what kind of rotations we have. You know, here at our school that we've, the UME office, has come out and set certain guidelines that goes with what they're staying, saying statewide and very limited in-person rotations. And only if you're from a Texas, from Texas and you could drive here. So that way you're not flying and bringing germs from other places. And only if you're at a school that doesn't have a PM&R program. So it isn't just open to anyone. Um, so what, programs are working on virtual experiences. Otherwise, for med students who can't come in, that is including our own, we're working on virtual experiences. We're asking resident, I keep on saying residents, you know what I mean? Medical students. Future residents. Future residents, yes. Budding residents to come to our virtual lectures. So our didactics right now, we can't get, we're a big residency program. We have you know, eight residents every year in a four-year program. So it's not okay for 32 residents and a lecturer to get together right now in a room. And so we're doing Zoom type virtual lectures and we're inviting students, if they have interest, they're able to come and see that and sit in. And there's some time before and after maybe to talk to the residents some. 
And so we are recommending doing that for students. They can start getting a feel, can start kind of meeting the residents that way to see how they'd also like the lecture series that's occurring and see if that's the way that they want to learn or where they want to be and who they want to be with. And so those are some of the things that I would recommend. Try to get as much virtual, even experience that they can get. Try to reach out and ask questions to residents and see if the residents want to partner on any projects together. And those are some of the things I recommend. It's definitely a challenging cycle, not just on the side of the student, but on the programs too. They also want to be competitive. They want to show their best face. We're all trying to figure out how we're going to do this best and how we can be inclusive in it. Yeah, I could, this is unprecedented and it seems like it's got to be difficult for, for everyone involved. Um, and I guess everyone's in the same boat and you know, what can you do at this point? It's just, it is what it is, but those are some good tips. And so thanks for sharing that. And my, uh, one of my last questions, um, what are your thoughts on Twitter and specifically med Twitter? And this is something that I am new to Twitter and I'm still trying to figure out what I use it for, what it's good for. And on one hand, I feel like it is sort of what LinkedIn is trying to be. And it can be this great way to network with people and connect with people um, and sort of get yourself out there and known. And on the other hand, I, I just feel it's also like a perilous place where you don't want to be unprofessional. And so you always err on the side of professionalism, but the same side, if you're just this carbon copy professional only person, you're not really saying anything of your personality. And so for me, I'm always trying to like, I want to be myself, but not be too loose or, or too rigid. And I just don't know if that's the right tact at all. Maybe it's better to, uh, to be just ultimately like ultra professional all the time. I know a lot of my, my, peers and colleagues are anonymizing themselves on social media because they don't want this to be found. But it seems like this could be a good way for you to just sort of interact with other people in your field online or people that are going into the same thing as you. So what are your thoughts about that? How should a medical student behave on Twitter, I guess, is my ultimate question. Yeah, I have a whole grand round that I give about this, but I'll give it to you in, you know, the three minute version. Sure, that's great. <laughs> and the first thing is that the world of social media is big. And so you can make a lot of connections. You It can really set you up for success. I don't think that you should have an anonymous account. I think you should be yourself and that you should try to interact as much professionally that you can with other people who are in med Twitter and physiatry Twitter, you know, ask questions, promote research, um, engage in content that other physiatrists are engaging in. You can sometimes follow a hashtag. So a lot of people use hashtag physiatry. There's hashtag PMR. There's hashtag ICU rehab, hashtag sports med. I mean, so many that you may have just an individual interest in and you can follow and kind of engage with that type of content. And I think for the most part, it can help you. The other thing that we said, you know, the world of social media is big, but it's also small. And so you have to be careful how you're using it. So you want to use it for good. You don't want to be unprofessional. You always want to, uh, you know, post things that are professional. Remember, I always say screenshots last forever. So even if you put something out there and it's there for long enough where someone can see it and screenshot something maybe unprofessional. So definitely, um, you know, you can post some um, just be, I try to stay away from anything too controversial. I don't tr try to get too political. I mean, I will stand up for things that are important. Black Lives Matter, that's not political. That's just a right and something. Right. But I'm not gonna you know, tell you who I'm voting for, who to vote for. I am stay away for anything too religious as well. Just try to kind of keep it to professional. But it's not always just like, oh, I'm only gonna be talking about brain injury today. Some of it's light and fun, like since we have kids, sometimes there's fun type of kid things you can talk about. So I was talking about um, the other day, my daughter who is a teenager wanted to buy some mom jeans because it seems like mom jeans are back in style. So I was adding, asking med Twitter about mom jeans and if they were back and you know, yeah, <laughs> just yeah. kind of getting opinions from my medical friends that way. And just like some fun con content to engage people. And I just want to use it a lot to promote having good information out there because there's a lot of 
bad information out there. And it's really surprising how many people go to social media, go to their feeds to look for medical content and they believe what's out there. So if you're, if the only thing that's out there is, you know, anti-vax or COVID is, is fake, then that's all people are going to see. So it behooves us as physicians to put good, true evidence-based content on there for people to see. Right. So kind of use it for that. And then I think it's a great tool for advocacy, for advocacy for persons with disability, for our field, for uh, what we can do as physiatrists, and, edu- and a great educational tool for people who, again, don't know about PM&R, and just a fun way to engage with people, get to know people. I've had a lot of opportunities come from just being on social media and you know it's allowed me to do more research with people that i've met that way it's allowed me to travel and do uh, presentations at other at different places i always joke and say oh i got this you know a dm that said that i was going to (laughs) invite me to go to puerto vallarta and I was like, oh, this seems totally fake, you know, and then it was like, oh, no, I'm really being asked to go to this Congress that's by the Physical Medicine Society of uh, one of the Mexi- Mexican groups, like all paid, you know, inclusive trip to Puerto Vallarta to speak about spasticity and brain injury. Yes, I will. Thank you, Twitter, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so good stuff can happen there. They can expose you to good networks and stuff. And I think you make a great point that we need positive voices to sort of not combat the negative voices, but just put the good content out there so it's not just a bunch of negative content. And right. I, I think that's a great point. Um, yeah. My final question, any parting advice you have for a medical student who's maybe interested in PM&R, any tips, wisdom, advice that you'd like to share? Yes, just try to learn about it as much as possible. Try to get as much ex- exposure as possible. There's, you know, there's groups like the AAP has med student type groups and there's virtual rotations that our people are doing and there's a lot of ways for students to engage and don't give up if it's something that you like. Keep on reaching out to people, keep on trying to have different experiences and, um, and you can do it. Awesome. Well, Dr. Verduska Gutierrez, thank you very much for chatting with us. Uh, we really learned a lot and, you know, hopefully we'll get this out soon and hopefully you had a good time as well. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Good luck. Thank you.